CompTIA A+, Core 2, Complete Training Course. Exam Objective 1.11 Identify Common Features and Tools of the Linux Client Desktop OS. Linux Commands. Remember how we tackled Windows CLI commands back in Exam Objective 1.2? Well this video segment will be very similar, with the exception that the commands we will cover now are designed to work within the Linux CLI. While we work through the list of commands that CompTIA wants us to know for the A+, Core 2, Certification Exam, I will intentionally keep my explanation simple and brief. Once I am done, if you find yourself hungry for more, don't worry, there are Linux-specific certifications that dive deeper into these topics. To kick things off, the Linux CLI, composed of a terminal and shell, is where all the magic happens. The terminal is the interface that allows you to input text-based commands, and the shell is the program that processes those commands and tells the operating system what to do. In Linux, the most common shell is Bash, or Born Again Shell. Now that you know what the terminal and shell are, let's shift our focus to the commands themselves. Let's begin with the basics of navigating the Linux file system. To start, the ls command is your go-to tool for listing the contents of a directory. It's like taking a peek inside a folder to see what's there. Additionally, the ls-a command will display hidden files and directories that are usually kept out of sight. In Linux, hidden files and folders start with a period, so anytime you see a file like .profile, you know it's one of those undercover files that prefers to stay out of the spotlight. Once you know what's inside a directory, you might wonder where exactly you are in the grand scheme of things. That's where the pwd command comes in handy, revealing your current working directory. Using this command is a lot like asking your GPS, where am I now? But in Linux terms, the pwd command responds with the directory you are currently located in, along with an exact file path to that directory, helping you keep your bearings. For the example behind me, we are able to determine that we are currently in the Jane user directory inside the home directory by using the pwd command. Now that you know where you are and what's in the directory, you might want to move some files around. For that, we have the mv command. This command allows you to move files from one location to another. It's essentially the cut and paste of the Linux CLI world. But wait, the mv command pulls double duty by also allowing you to rename files so you get twice the functionality with just one command. As an example, let's say Jane has a file named draft.txt in her home directory. She wants to move this file to her documents folder and rename it to final.txt at the same time. To accomplish this, the command she would use is mv space forward slash home forward slash Jane forward slash draft.txt space forward slash home forward slash Jane forward slash documents forward slash final dot txt. This accomplishes both moving the file to the documents folder and renaming it in one step. In this command mv is short for move. This is followed by the source file, and the last part is the destination path along with the new file name. If moving files isn't the answer you are looking for, maybe a quick copy will do. That's where the cp command comes into play. cp is perfect for duplicating files or creating backups, while leaving the original file intact. For instance, if Jane wants to make a copy of report.txt from her home directory and place it in her backup folder, she would simply run cp space forward slash home forward slash Jane forward slash report.txt space forward slash home forward slash Jane forward slash backup forward slash. This duplicates the file and stores the copy in the backup folder. Just like the mv command, the cp command is first followed by the source file, and then the destination directory where the copy will be placed. Of course, there comes a time when some files need to be deleted, and that's where the rm command steps in. Think of it as Linux's equivalent to the delete key, only here, there's no recycle bin to retrieve files from the abyss once they're gone. If Jane wants to remove report.txt, located in her home folder, she would simply type rm, followed by forward slash home, forward slash Jane, report.txt, and poof, it's gone for good. This command is powerful, so handle it with care, because once it's executed, there's no turning back. When it comes to modifying file permissions, the chumoth command is your go-to tool. 
It allows you to control who can read, write, or execute a file, giving you full power over who can access or change it. Permissions can be adjusted using either numerical codes or the plus and minus symbols. For example, if Jane wants to set permissions for script.sh so that she, as the owner, can read, write, and execute the file, while others can only read the file, she would use chmod 744 script.sh. The 744 is a numerical code that sets different levels of access, specifically full permissions for Jane and read permissions for everyone else. On the other hand, if Jane simply wants to add execution rights for all users to script.sh, she would use chmod plus x script.sh, adding the execute permission without changing anything else. Don't worry too much about memorizing all the details for this command right now. At this point in your journey, it is sufficient to just know that the chmod command is used to manage file permissions. Now, let's talk about the chom command. This command is used to change the ownership of files and directories. Just like handing over the keys to a new owner, chom lets you transfer control of a file from one user or group to another. For example, if Jane wants to transfer ownership of project.txt from herself to another user named Bob, she would use the command chom bob, project.txt. This makes Bob the new owner of the file. Simple, right? Now, let's dive into the su and sudo commands. The su command allows you to switch users entirely, like stepping into someone else's shoes. For instance, if Jane needs to switch to another user named Bob to manage his files or run commands as him, she can type su bob and then enter Bob's password. After entering Bob's password, Jane is now logged in as Bob and can run commands as him. As for sudo, this is more like borrowing someone's hat for a quick task rather than switching users entirely. When using sudo, Jane can execute a single command with elevated privileges without fully logging in as another user. For instance, if she wants to install software that requires elevated privileges, she would use sudo apt-get install followed by the package name. After entering the appropriate password, the command is executed with super user rights, but she remains logged in as herself. The difference is subtle but important, su switches you to another user entirely, while sudo allows you to run specific commands with elevated privileges. Next, we have the apt-get command. We briefly saw this command in action with the sudo example, but now we will take a closer look. The apt-get command is a powerful package management tool for Debian-based Linux distributions, allowing you to install, update, and remove software directly from the command line. For instance, if Jane wants to install a new application, she would run sudo apt-get install followed by the package name. The command would then fetch and install the specified package along with any required dependencies. But apt-get isn't just about installing software, it's also great for keeping your system updated. Jane can run sudo apt-get update to refresh the list of available packages, ensuring she's ready to install the latest versions. Then, if she wants to upgrade all of her installed packages to the newest versions, she would follow up with sudo apt-get upgrade. With apt-get, Jane has full control over her system's software management, making sure everything stays current and compatible. Now let's meet apt-get's twin, the yum command. While apt-get is the go-to for Debian-based Linux distributions, yum handles package management on RPM-based systems. Just like its twin, yum allows you to install, update, and remove applications and functionality through the command line. For example, if Jane is using a RPM-based system and wants to install an application, she would run sudo yum install followed by the package name and yum would handle downloading and installing the necessary packages. The yum command also helps with system maintenance. To make sure her package database is up to date, Jane can run sudo yum check update, which lists available updates for installed packages. To apply those updates, she can use sudo yum update, which upgrades all installed packages to the latest versions. Whether you're managing software or keeping your system fresh, yum is the reliable counterpart to apt-get in the world of RPM-based Linux distributions. Next up are the ifconfig and ip commands, two essential tools for networking in Linux. The ifconfig command is used to configure network interfaces. With it, you can manually set an IP address, view your system's MAC address, or bring network interfaces up or down. 
while it's still used in older systems and is a handy tool for network configuration, if config has largely been replaced by the more modern IP command. The IP command offers more features and flexibility compared to if config. It can do everything if config does and more. For example, with IP, you can not only assign IP addresses and view MAC addresses, but also manage routing, tunnels, and much more. If Jane wants to check her network configuration using the modern approach, she would use the command IP A D D R show. This specific command would provide a view of IP addresses and interfaces. In short, while if config gets the job done, IP is the more powerful and current tool for managing network interfaces in Linux. Next up is the dig command, another essential networking tool, especially for DNS troubleshooting. The dig command allows you to perform DNS lookups, helping you troubleshoot domain name resolution issues. For example, if Jane wants to check the IP address associated with example.com, she would run dig example.com and the command would return DNS records for the domain. Moving on, we have the df command, which helps you monitor your system's disk space usage. One such use of this command would be df-h. This gives you a quick overview of how much space is being used and how much is available on each mounted file system. For instance, when Jane runs df-h on her Linux system, she might see her root partition, denoted by a simple forward slash is 63% full, while her home partition is at 79% capacity. This command is particularly useful when Jane wants to ensure her system isn't running low on space, which could lead to performance issues or crashes. By regularly checking disk usage, she can proactively manage her storage and avoid any unpleasant surprises. Now we have covered quite a few Linux commands so far. Hopefully, you are finding this both informative and fun. Let's keep the momentum going with some more useful commands that will further help you take charge of your Linux system. First up is the ps command, short for process status. This command gives you a snapshot of the currently running processes on your system. For example, running psaux will show a detailed list of processes, including the process ID, CPU usage, memory usage, and the command that started each process. This is perfect for quickly identifying what's running on your system and if any processes might be hogging resources. If you like the ps command but need something more dynamic, the top command can help. This command displays real-time system performance, including CPU and memory usage. I know the image behind me is static, but the data will refresh continuously with this command until you decide to move on. Using the top command is similar to having a live task manager right in your terminal. Our next command on the list is the find command. This powerful tool is used for locating files on your system. If Jane is trying to find report.txt that happens to be hidden somewhere within her home directory, she can simply run find forward slash home forward slash Jane dash name report.txt and the command will quickly pinpoint the file's location and show the, the full file path. This is a lifesaver when you're hunting down files in a maze of directories. Next, let's talk about the cat command, which no, it doesn't have anything to do with actual cats, but it does like to let your files out of the bag. The cat command is perfect for quickly displaying the text contents of a file directly in the terminal. For example, if Jane wants to take a quick peek inside notes.txt, she can run cat notes.txt, and the entire file will be printed right out in the terminal for her to read. No scratching or clawing necessary, just a simple and efficient way to view file contents without opening an editor. And in case you are wondering, an editor is a tool that allows users to create, view, and modify text files. In Linux, a simple terminal-based editor option would be Nano. Nano is a straightforward, easy-to-use editor built into the terminal, ideal for making quick changes to files without needing a full graphical interface. After viewing the contents of a file, Jane might want to search for a specific word or phrase within it. That's where the grep command comes in. Grep allows you to search through text for specific text patterns. For instance, if she's looking for all instances of the word error in log.txt, she can run grep error log.txt, and grep will display all the matching lines of text. This command is a powerful tool for digging through large files or logs and quickly finding the information you need. 
The final command in this segment is the MAN command, your built-in help system for Linux. Short for manual, the MAN command is your go-to resource for learning more about any other command, tool, or function in the Linux CLI. Whenever Jane is unsure about how a command works or what options it has, she can simply type MAN followed by the command name, like MAN grep, to pull up a detailed manual. This will give her a full breakdown of the command syntax, available options, and examples of usage. It's like having a command reference book at your fingertips, making MAN one of the most useful tools in any Linux user's toolbox. Guess I saved the best for last. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more great content.